things that they intended is not happening. People are fighting, creditors are coming, sometimes beneficiaries are fighting with each other. And a lot of, a lot of the money that's in the estate is thrown away in litigation. So these, there are some ways to avoid these things. So today the topic is uh, probate matters. So let's get started with your permission. So why do estate planning? The primary reasons are, you know, we worked hard for everything we have, so we want to make sure we provide for our loved ones. You know, we mitigate avoiding probate process. Probate process means there's a lot of things that can happen when somebody passes away or something happens to somebody. Then there, there could be litigation, there could be courtroom things, so there's a lot of things that will happen. So we want to mitigate and just avoid a lot of those expenses. Taxes are a big thing. You know, there's a lot of taxes. Orderly administration and stewardship of property. So you want to decide how your assets are going to be handled. You want to have full control of that even after you pass away. Well, you can, you can make some documents that will make your wishes come true on how this is handled. So you, and you protect your asset and then providing for incapacity. Incapacity means something happened to you. You cannot make a decision. Maybe an accident, maybe stroke, maybe some something, dementia. Something happened, you're no longer legally available to make decisions. So those type of things we have to plan for. So what are probate matters? Probate includes, probate matters is a general, very general term. It includes wills. And how do you have a will in Texas? I'll discuss more details about a will. A will has to be in writing. It has to be signed by whom? The testator. Testator means the person who's making the will. This is your will, you're the testator. Either you sign it or you get somebody to sign on your behalf if you're physically unable to sign it. Then you get someone to, a person to sign on your behalf in the presence of the testator and under the direction of the testator. And the other requirement is it must be attested by two credible witnesses. That means two witnesses have to witness this whole thing. They have to be present in their handwriting. They have to sign. Okay, so it's not DocuSign or something. They have to be there. This is what's required in Texas to have a valid will. So you have wills. You have estate issues, which is kind of general. Something happens to uh, you and the estate needs to be handled properly. Even if you have a wife, if something happens to you, there's an estate, and your wife is a separate estate at that mo moment, legally, unless you have a will. Go ahead. I thought, uh, you know, your next top pin will automatically in charge of the estate. Uh, your no, it's not that simple. So, what happens is if you die, it's intestate, that means you don't have a will. Then there's some automatic laws that come in first. Your children will get part, like, Texas is a community property state. Okay, so if you die, then your wife has uh, half interest in the entire community that you own. Everything you own during, everything you made during your marriage, that belongs to the community. It doesn't just belong to you. So she will have half interest, you will have half interest. If you die, then she doesn't have control of your, your half. There's some laws that happen. If you have children, then it goes to, it can be controlled by that. If they don't have children, then next to kid, she can lose control of your half. So even in the house you're living in, could become a problem if you, if you die without a will. Now, the witness, you said, the witness could be part of a family member? It can be, it, the Texas law is very relaxed about the, the witness. It even says somebody over the age of 14, I didn't put that up there. That's not advisable. You want an adult, <clears throat> it's better to have outsiders. There, and so when we do our will, what we do is we bring you guys into the office during the execution. That's another thing. Getting a will done, you have to be very careful. I always recommend if you don't use us, use some attorney. And the reason is there are some steps that need to be properly taken. There's a will signing ceremony. There's a, all of those things that the attorney has to have said. The witness can attest to that. 
if those things don't happen and there's a fight over this, it can be a problem. Okay, so uh, what we do in our office is we'll have some of my staff will be here with this. One of my staff members will be the notary also. So uh, you have an independent third party who's not related to you. That's what I would recommend. Better not to bring your kid, you know, your son or daughter. Okay, sort of a Sure. So you said that uh, if the person who is initiating will, if that person cannot sign, some note can sign. Who, who's that someone? They can assign any adult, any competent adult, because maybe they physically cannot sign, fine. but they can direct somebody to sign, but they have to be present. So who we'll missed that, or who can sign? And the two witnesses have to be witnesses all the time. Okay. If, if you guys use us, then we will make sure all of that is done properly. Yeah. Right, so there, there won't be any issues. <laughs> issues come up later in court, and that's when all the problems will come up. <clears throat> so probate matters, you have wills, you have estate issues, you have trusts, and we'll talk about trusts in a little bit, and then you have something called guardianship. Guardianship is when someone is incapacitated, then you can apply, go to the court, and become their guardian. For example, if you have so if you have uh, one of your elderly parents, suddenly they may have some dementia or something, you can apply to go to the court and apply for guardianship. Now you have to go to a medical doctor and they will have to do an examination and fill out a medical report. And you file that with the court, then you can gain access to their interest. Now there's two types of guardianship, we'll get to that. So guardianship is another whole thing. Or sometimes, unfortunately, in the community or in the Intela related to the handicap, I think, you know, development issues or whatever that. But so once they become an adult, you know, you, you gotta make sure you are a guardian. You have guardianship. You're automatically guard, a guardian of your kids. They're underage, that's no problem. But once they become 18, if there's a problem that you have to because uh, like, you won't have control over, you know, and then the state could come in, and then all kinds of problems could happen. So those are the main things about COVID. Those, those are the issues. If not done right, there will be litigation. Us attorneys don't mind doing the litigation, but it's too expensive. So the guardianship is different in each country, is that right? The guardianship process? No, it's a Texas law that applies here. So you would go and file it in the county that you're residing in. So the laws will, will be the same, but you have to go to the court in that county. So the process is different or the process is the same? It, it's the same. It's the same. It's just that some courts, the law is the same, but some judges have their own. If you live in Montgomery County, for example, that's a rural county, they run things a little differently. And the judge over there may not specialize in probate. See, in big counties like Harris County uh, and even in Brooklyn County, there's specialty courts. There are all district courts or county courts, but some will handle um, family law, some will handle probate law. But in small counties, one judge could be handling many things. And that's not really a good thing. But So it's a county by county, but the law is the same all over Texas. So that's the main general things about probate. So let's talk about wills. So everybody says, oh, I get a will or not, you know, and that is So there's a lot that goes into it. If, if it has to be done correctly. And that's why I, I recommend that you use an attorney to do it. Whether you use our firm or any other firm, but go to an attorney that, that handles that. Because there's a lot of little things. Usually, maybe there's no problem. Maybe it's a simple will, and nobody challenges anything it goes through, but problems happen. Creditors can come, somebody else will assert a right. If there's a business, then maybe there's a business partner or somebody you know, who's an investor. I mean, there could be a lot of things I think, that could happen. So I would recommend um, you know, going to an attorney and, and do it very correctly. And when we do a, a will, we don't just draft one document and call it good. We have uh, what we call a uh, wills packet. So we have seven different uh, documents that we produce 
for our clients. So let's talk about each one. The main one, the first one is the last will and testament. That's your main document. This is where you lay down, you know, what you own, how you want it distributed, whom you want it to go to, you know, 25% to the kid, 25% of the spouse, or, you know, whatever else, however else you, you want to do it. The way you want to do it, we will draft it like that. And it has a lot of details. It's a big document. Uh, it has many parts to it. And we don't need to go through the whole thing. That's, that, when we sit down, we can, we can do that. But that's your main document, the last will and testament. That's what you, a lot of you guys will just go and have it done by somebody and you know, you just got that one. But there's a lot of other things that happen. There's a document called revocable transfer on death deed. This is a good way to protect your spouse. So we can file this with the, with the county. So you can have a transfer on death deed. So the minute you die, the spouse or whomever you name will get your interest in that house. So the problem is, let's say you have a $700,000 house, you die and you don't have a will. It could be problematic because suddenly there's an estate created. Now you have to go to court and how that's going to be distributed. The judge wants to make sure that all the, um, the people, beneficiaries, potential beneficiaries are contacted. So if you have children all over the United States, they have to be uh, properly noticed, <coughs> served. So all kinds of things happen. But if you have this document, immediately your wife gets the whole thing. She's in full control. There's no turning over. If she needs to sell the house immediately, no problem. Because now she owns it completely without having to go through all that. Otherwise, it'll be months and months before she can do anything with it. He or she can do anything with the house. So that's revocable transfer on debt. So we will, we will do that. There's a declaration of guardian. So this is kind of a nice thing to do because most of the time the spouse will name each other. So if something happens to you, you have a stroke and you're incapacitated, you appoint your wife to be the guardian and she can take control. So she doesn't have to go through all of this process. <clears throat> so declaration of guardian. HIPAA release is also important. Now, even with spouses, it's hard sometimes to get medical records. In the middle of a crisis, you're in the hospital, you need emergency surgery, but you need some other documents from the previous doctor, the scan, you know, it may not be that quick to get it. You have one of these, it's very fast. So we'll have a HIPAA release. Directive to physicians, this is what you want. If, you're, if you can be revived, then you want treatment. If you cannot be or you know, you can put down what you want. This is, some people call it like a living will. Directed to physicians. This is another thing we'll draft for you guys. And then, the medical power of attorney. This is a lot of times the spouse will name each other to take control of, uh, you know, we have an incident on that, the dentist and not a bunch of them. There was a case, you know, who decides? He was in the middle of a divorce, but the divorce is not there yet. So she's, she has superior rights. The son is involved. His brothers are involved. They go to court. You know, it became a huge issue. Meanwhile, he's on the, on the machine, just days after days after days. Then the judge finally heard all of this. And I think the last thing was he gave the right to the son. So, you know, but think about what all happened during that, in the middle of this, somebody's dying, and how much fighting there was between the brother, the family, the, the wife, the son, everybody's involved. Okay. Yeah, sir, the will has to be made by both parties or a single party can do it? So when we do the will, we do two separate wills. You sign your own will, your wife will sign her own will. And in her will, a lot of this, you will be named, and your will, she will be named. Two different parties. So, 
So retirement is, is a little separate, but yes, assets generally have to be, now you can make some general statements, all my assets will, I'm, I'm giving it to my wife. You can make statements like that, that'll cover a lot of things. Retirement accounts generally, when you set up your retirement account, you put a beneficiary there, right? So it'll, it'll, that'll go smoothly. Yeah, we keep the, the retirement stuff out of this. And that's a separate deal, it doesn't have to be broken. ഒന്നിച്ചു <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a big problem. So what I would do is this. I would give one copy to the attorney and we keep electronic okay. copies and then we are on the cloud. Okay, so our, our, our data is stored on the cloud. So almost at the end, we should have a, at least a copy. But that is a big deal. Actually, you want the original. You know, sometimes we'll make two originals. Have, have a sit. Yeah. No, no, no. No, no, we don't register in the county. You, bet, you should give it to your lawyer. You should put it in the county. You should put it in the county. So you should put that in there. Well, okay. I'd say, I'd say if I put the USB and put it in the Yeah, you can make a couple of copies, but the problem is copies are, if it goes to litigation, uh, by, it'll work, it becomes a little harder, but that's when the witnesses will help. The witnesses can come in and test. So, that is true. It's not, passport you have to maintain that somehow. So, you can buy these fireproof uh, safes, we didn't rent you. Fire on dial that should be okay. Any natural calamities, like a fire, hurricane, most of these medical staff, especially the medical care of attorney, if he's to the hospital, Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the medical power of training they'll keep it. Yeah. That hospital will keep it. Yeah, that, that's true. And then there's what's called the durable power of attorney. Now this one's pretty important. Okay. So you can make a power of attorney for anything you want. A, a power of attorney, you can make a general power of attorney. I, I don't recommend that. You can make a power of attorney for your finances. You can make a power of attorney to sell a house. You know, you, you, you can do anything. Durable power of attorney, though, it's kind of a general power of attorney. You can live it the way you want. Durable power of attorney means something happens to you, you become incapacitated, that power of attorney survives and it is still in force. So durable power of attorney will, so you will name your wife maybe uh, to be uh, your uh, power of attorney. So then she can take control. And some of the things, these are some examples of what you could name in the durable power of attorney. Any real estate transactions, tangible property transactions, stocks, bonds, commodity, banking, business transactions, insurance, estate trust, beneficiary transactions, any litigation, family, personal maintenance, so benefits from government, retirement, tax, and digital, even your Facebook account, all of that. So, These are the examples of the things we can, we like to put in there. Now you don't have to check all of that, but whatever fits your needs. So this is the durable power of attorney. So you have to trust somebody. So this is because you're incapacitated. 
either you died or you're mentally gone or something serious, you're unconscious, coma, whatever. This is what happens. So this is what you need to do. You need to have persons you can trust. So you need an executor. So the executor is the one that executes the will. What you uh, ask to do, give me one second. What you ask to do in the will, the first the executor has to do it. Now the executor can be compensated. It can be anybody. It can be your best friend. It can be your wife. It can be your kid. Uh, as long as they're adult. It can be uh, your attorney. It can be anybody you, but you, somebody you trust. Okay. You have the power of attorney. So when somebody passes away, it's still valid that you have the power of attorney. So once you pass away, then the estate issues yeah. take over. It's it's when you're incapacitated. Yeah. Okay. You're still That's alive. That's one. Yeah. yeah. Then the will and all of those other things take over. So the, the choosing the executive is very important. Now, a lot of times, the husband and wife, they will choose each other. But we also like to have second and third options. What if both of you died in a car accident or something? So who's the next you know, option? If the wife cannot do it or something happens to her, then who? You know, you select one of your, one of your kids or somebody you trust, your brother, sister, whoever. But think about that. Think about whom you want. You know, first option, second option, third option. Okay? We used to like to put two uh, two alternates. So, and then, then of course, the agent of power of attorney. Power of attorney is you're appointing an agent to act on your behalf, on whatever you said the power of attorney is for. So that's. So let's talk about guardianship. So I'm going to jump on the quickly through this, but if you have questions, you know, I'll happy to answer. Guardianship is another issue, right? This is, we talked about it a little bit earlier. This is when you take control of somebody. Somebody elderly, uh, that could be the case, or even, you know, some child who's an adult, but, you know, not 100% mentally uh, developed. So that, that could be, and so there's guardianship of person. You can take control of all their personal decisions, their health, taking care of them, their medication, things like that. So there's guardianship of person and guardianship of, uh, there's guardianship of the state. So guardianship of the state is, the guardianship is limited to uh, matters of the estate, the business, um, the money, the bank accounts, things like that. Or you can take both, guardianship of both. So that's that's guardianship. The way it happens is you go to the court, you have you have to have the person examined by a, a, a doctor, the doctor, usually a neurologist. They have to uh, give you a form and sign that this person is incapacitated. They cannot make legal decisions. You take that to the court, you have to inform all of the, the children of this person that they're elderly. They have a right to object or come to court and fight. We are now in a litigation where this is happening. This is, they have eight children. This lady has eight children. Seven of them are on one page, taking care of their elderly mother. One took the mother and one returned. And it became a big fight. So, we're in litigation right now. We go to court. There's a lot of money being spent, but we are now on the verge of getting winning this thing for our client. And so we're on the team of the seven. We think this one person is being, I don't know about their motivations, but it happens. And sometimes it's just a disagreement. You're not taking care of mother properly. I know how to do it better. You know, it's, it's as simple as that. So. So do we need a guardianship? Uh, do they have a durable power of attorney? So durable power of attorney can help with a lot, but it's power of attorneys can be revoked. So if they're deep confident, confident, they can revoke it. So it's not forever. Guardianship, on the other hand, you become there. It's like how what kind of control you have over your children. You have absolute control. You can decide what treatment they're going to get, 
where they're going to go to school, you have full control. That's what guardianship will do. So if somebody is incapacitated, it's better to go with the guardianship. You have more rights. And you don't have to explain to the bank, hey, here's my uh, power of attorney. Can you, you know, you don't have to do any of that. You're full control. <clears throat> so guardianship, you can do both. Of the person, of the estate, or both. 